All right. Let's release the hounds. Welcome, welcome one and all a fabulous Thanksgiving weekend to you. Thank you for uh, rousing yourselves from your holiday naps and uh, joining us for a riveting discussion of carbonic maceration. So this is a, a kind of a different kind of class uh, than we have conducted uh, before. It is a, a delightfully nerdy uh, venture. And I will say, we haven't been short on delightfully nerdy ventures here at uh, Revelers Hour, Tail Up Go, but um, this is you know, particularly nerdy for the sake of bringing together a batch of wines that are uh, united by a winemaking principle. So uh, we are shining a light on wildly refreshing uh, group of wines uh, that are tailor-made for the holidays are the kinds of thing that you can, uh, you know, drink all day, uh, drink with just about anything you throw on the Thanksgiving table. Uh, they are delicious on their own and uh, they are fabulous with food as well. And uh, the French call them glue glue, um, which is, you know, just their kind of version of our glug glug, which is to say the kinds of wines that you want to drink from the bottle. And typically glue glue is applied to gluggable red wines. And that's what we're focusing on today um, because the technique that we are further exploring carbonic maceration is uh, typically deployed uh, for red wines. Um, and it's a, a fascinating uh, bit of winemaking methodology and it begs all sorts of deeper questions about wine and how we think of it. Because I think, you know, the popular image of wine is as uh, this repository of place, this communicator of typicity and terroir. Um, but carbonic maceration kind of uh, pulls in a different direction. It makes wine into something a little more ubiquitously refreshing. Uh, it can run roughshod over typicity of place. And I think at the end of the day, the question is, are we comfortable with that in our wines? You know, uh, is that a, a rightful role? Uh, for for wine to play, you know, is it you know just as useful um, as wines that are made in a a more classic kind of Burgundian style and that are more robust and more age worthy? And um, you know, we're going to lit in those questions today. I don't want to offer offer you know any uh, pithy um, you know kind of suggestions about the answer. I don't want to pre prescribe um, you know kind of conclusions uh, for the sake of this debate. Uh, I want us to lit um, in this mystery. So uh, we have four bottles and the bottles varied over the course of the month. Um, we have a pair of Beaujolais, the very pair of Beaujolais um, that we um, sold over the course of November. Uh, one of which is a more classic um, uh, Beaujolais Village and one of which is Nouveau. We'll talk about the difference forthrightly. Um, and then we're gonna move into uh, Spanish red, um, the uh, kind of playfully named Cabronicas um, I'll follow that up with uh, California juice. Love you bunches. Um, and uh, close things out with the uh, unicorn carbonically macerated white wine. It does exist, Virginia. There is such a thing. Um, and uh, that one is uh, out of uh, the Bergenland in Eastern Austria. Um, Without further ado, um, uh, let us uh, kick things off. I want to thank you all, of course, for joining us, whether it's your first time or 57th, um, this being uh, lesson 57. Um, without further ado, i uh, going to kick things off here with a bit of verse as we are wont to do. Thrilled to have Zoe back in the mix with a virtual background. Everybody wish uh, Zoe and her dog Penny. Uh, all the love. She is 14 years going on strong. Um, uh, and uh, here we are uh, for the sake of verse. This is Robinson uh, Jeffers. Um, he was uh, famously a pacifist, uh, opposed U.S. Uh, intervention in World War II, didn't win a lot of friends for it, uh, but pen some glorious verse, um, uh, significantly um, about the natural world. Uh, he lived the bulk of his life in the central coast of California, which is where uh, Love You Bunches, Stoltman, uh, vineyards uh, is located. This is called Wonder and Joy. The things that one grows tired of, oh, be sure they are only foolish artificial things. Can a bird ever tire of having wings? And I, so long as life and sense endure, or brief 
be they, shall nevermore inure my heart to the recurrence of the springs of gray dawns, the gracious evenings, the infinite wheeling stars. A wonder pure must ever well within me to behold Venus decline or great Orion whose belt is studded with three nails of burning gold, ascend the winter heaven, who never felt this wondering joy may yet be good or great, but envy him not. He is not fortunate. Brilliant. So uh, today I, I like that, um, you know, idea of, um, you know, joy vis-a-vis, uh, uh, -vis, um, you know, kind of um, a uh, bold-faced wonder um, at the joy of creation uh, for the sake of something like Orion's Belt or uh, easy drinking wine uh, for the sake of the offerings we're enjoying uh, today. Um, so these are the uh, Orion's Belt of wines, uh, such as it is. And uh, we're going to kick things off with dueling Beaujolais. And uh, we're going to do something a little different here. Zoe, do you have Beaujolais at home? I do not. I have some tea. I'm going to be working all night. Boo, boo. I know. Um, uh, at any rate, Zoe, you're going to have to speak uh, historically in terms of your knowledge of, um, you know, carbonic wines and Beaujolais such as it, it exists. Um, and um, I will... Uh, fill in with some tasting notes, but I encourage you, uh, I know we, we usually do better with participation uh, on the chat when we're, you know, uh, you know, several dozen minutes deep and a few glasses of wine strong, but uh, I encourage you uh, to pipe in sooner because uh, we're doing things a little differently here. Uh, we're going to start with the wine in the glass um, for the sake of this consideration because, you know, this is all about glue glue. Glue glue, again, uh, French on a onomatopoeia uh, for glug glug. And we're con uh, con considering the, the wonder and joy that is Beaujolais to kick things off. I have two Beaujolais here from two different uh, producers. Um, uh, the one to my right here is Beaujolais Village. I have a map of Beaujolais. Um, this is um, kind of adhering to the, the classic uh, French tradition of identifying a wine by its designation of origin. Uh, these are geographically based creatures in the French system. To, to say Beaujolais implies the rest. It implies almost monolithically Gamay. Gamay, that great um, underdog grape, famously out, outlawed in Burgundy as early as the 14th century. Uh, it finds a toehold in the granitic outcroppings of Northern Beaujolais in particular. Um, and that is the crew zone, 10 crews, which you see here. Um, uh, the darker purple area is the Beaujolais village region. It corresponds to a number of villages that turn out wine um, that are regulated more stringently than the wines throughout the rest of the region and uh, have elevated status as such. Uh, this particular one, I'm going to zoom in, no one yak yet, um, uh, comes from uh, a winemaking merchant named uh, Christophe Hacolet, and he's the nephew of one of our great heroes uh, for the sake of this discourse, Marcel Lapier, but more about him later. Um, Christophe is a <coughs> negociant, so he uh, purchases fruit and uh, makes wine in his chai or cellar in Sercier. Uh, which is just south of Morgon uh, and B. Morgon, which is uh, home base for uh, now Marcel's uh, son and daughter who run the roost uh, at his estate. Um, this particular vineyard is in uh, Lantigue. Uh, Lantigne is uh, just west of the crew zone and is one of the most famous villages in uh, the Beaujolais village zone. Incidentally, the region takes its name from the village of Beaujau. Um, uh, there was a, a, a duke of Beaujau once upon a time uh, before the whole region got usurped um, by the duke of Burgundy. Uh, but uh, this particular vineyard in uh, Lantigny, um, the vines are very old. Uh, they come from 1911 uh, for the sake of this particular wine. Um, and that is uh, this offering from Christophe Bacolet. Uh, this is a 2020 vintage wine. Now, 2020 uh, was a truly a global warming vintage. Uh, very hot, very dry, a sign of things to come in Beaujolais. This wine sits comfortably at 13.5% alcohol. And Christophe had to exercise some, rest some restraint um, to uh, bring it in at that level. A lot of the wines, a lot of the um, other uh, villages I've seen uh, from 2020 tip the scales at 14 plus. Now, this other offering I uh, have for a year from uh, Domaine de Cornillac. Um, I need to it hails from, uh, it should be said, um, a different corner of uh, the region. Um, it hails from um, further south, um, outside of the cruise zone um, in um, Saint-Berant, um, so the southwestern extreme. 
um, uh, along a tributary of the Sone. The Sone is a itself a tributary of their own that runs north-south and kind of defines the uh, eastern boundary of the region. Um, now, the southern zone of Beaujolais um, uh, is different ge uh, geologically than the northern zone. Uh, much more limestone there, although there are granitic outcroppings and uh, Domaine de Corniac has some granite. Um, uh, it should be said that granite degrades into the kinds of sands that Gamay adores. Gamay um, typically doesn't establish um, a deeper root system on limestone quite as well as Pinot Noir, for instance, does, which is why um, originally it was outlawed um, in uh, Burgundy proper, um, again, uh, many centuries ago, and found um, this kind of spiritual home um, in Beaujolais. Now, um, we're going to taste these two wines. The Nouveau um, stems from this tradition, uh, the Corniac, um, stands for the tradition of releasing wine and primer. Um, so uh, Nouveau is the new wine. It is uh, 2021. 2021, very different vintage from 2020. Um, the uh, Nouveau here from Domaine de Corniac uh, tipping the scales at 12.5% alcohol, which is much more typical for Beaujolais historically. It is a lighter, easier drinking wine. That's not to say that Gamay can't turn out bigger, broader shouldered offerings, but um, in this case, uh, it is easier drinking. Now, um, this whole wine and Premier thing um, was a phenomenon all around France, uh, but particularly in Beaujolais, but uh, it came um, into its own um, in the 50s, 60s, into the 70s and 80s through the ages of this gentleman's father, George de Vaux. Um, uh, I would have pulled up a picture of George himself. This is Frank de Vaux, but this is just too good a picture. Um, uh, very Rex Manning here with, uh, um, I think that's a got to be a Jeroboam. Um, uh, that's four regular bottles at the very least of uh, Beaujolais Nouveau. Uh, and uh, Nouveau became this global marketing phenomenon through the ages of Frank's father, George de Boeuf. Um, uh, he took this tradition of releasing wine and from her, um, the first uh, release, um, coinciding with the third Thursday in November. And he made it this global phenomenon. Uh, he sent the Concorde across uh, the pond uh, from Beaujolais, from Paris to New York, held these epic release parties um, that were modeled after uh, this kind of original release, this original um, journey of the wine from Beaujolais proper to Paris uh, that coincided um, uh, with the end of harvest. Now, these are uh, not necessarily uh, wines that are built to last. They are fresh, fruity, easier drinking, and that has everything to do with how they're made, which we're going to get to very shortly. Now, um, uh, I want to taste these two wines and get your feedback on what, um, uh, you know, distinguishes these wines from, you know, the more serious uh, red wines that, you know, I think typically people want when they ask for red wine. I find at the restaurants when, you know, guests ask for red wine, what they're really saying is give me a big fucking glass of red wine. You know, these are not that. These are immensely drinkable, uh, as I said, glue, glue uh, kinds of offerings. You know, they are the beer of wines um, and uh, enjoyable as such, uh, but different uh, than what, you know, we've been you know, trained to appreciate uh, for the sake of breads. Now, Zoe, what do you like uh, about, um, uh, you know, Nouveau, about Beaujolais, uh, such as it is? And, and what's your experience of these wines? Well, they'll always live in my heart because we open Reveler's Hour with Nouveau on our minds, but we also jumped into everything about Beaujolais, so it will always be there. Um, I think that Beaujolais Nouveau in particular can go well with so many things, and now that we are making it not just in the tutti fruity kind of a way, and we have these premier producers making like such poppable wine, yes, it's great for this week and downing all the turkey, but they just pair so well with everything. And then Beaujolais as a whole has so much variety from like the quaffable Nouveaux to something that's more structured, like the Moulin Vents and the Morgons of the world. It's just such a large amounts of variety within one grape, within one very specific place. Uh, that's a great point, Zoe. And I get a sense of that for the sake of these two wines. So most of you at home will be drinking um, the uh, Beaujolais Village, um, which is uh, in my right hand um, uh, here. And uh, the color, I don't know if you get any sense of this whatsoever. This is like the least riveting uh, piece of, you know, uh, podcasting or whatever the hell we're doing, uh, Zooming that we've ever offered for the sake of colors. Kind of can't get a sense of this um, uh, through the magic of uh, my Apple uh, camera, but um, uh, much more kind of a deeper um, garnet color to the Beaujolais Village, whereas the Nouveau 
is much more kind of intensely uh, violet purple. Um, and uh, that has to do with the youth of one wine versus another. Uh, it can also have to do with the um, uh, temperature on the fermentation. Um, do you have some good tasting notes from uh, the crowd uh, for the sake of either of these wines? So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it seems like the Pacolet is super um, juicy, kind of, um, I like the the Gushers vibe um, is a really nice note. Um, we also have that the, the Christophe has a lot of black cherry, some raspberry and bramble, a little forest floor in the mix as well. Yeah, those are all great tasting notes. And it's a wine that's, you know, dominated almost exclusively uh, by fruit. Um, but you know, the, the type of fruit is that, you know, tart berry fruit is that ripe, fresh uh, summer fruit, um, as opposed to um, anything that's like cooked or stewed or baked or manipulated at all. Um, it is, you know, fruit at the height of, of summer. Um, and even, you know, maybe a little before um, peak ripeness uh, for the sake of these wines. And there's an immediacy to them. Uh, they're juicy, they're approachable, uh, they're delicious. It's not necessarily the kind of thing that you know, you linger over, it's the kind of thing you throw back. And, you know, that's, you know, very much what they um, are intended for, uh, for the sake of enjoyment. Now, um, the question begs, why uh, do they taste this way? Why aren't they more sturdy and tannic the way a lot of reds are? Why don't they have, you know, that layers of spice and uh, those layers of spice in earth that certainly Gamay can have in other iterations and certainly that we expect of other uh, red wines? Well, um, to answer my own question, uh, that has everything to do um, with uh, how they are produced. And uh, our watchword today is going to be carbonic maceration. Carbonic maceration. So, um, carbonic maceration uh, refers to, um, at its essence, intracellular fermentation. Thank you, Guild Sam, uh, which sounds hopelessly clinical um, and is, but. Uh, at the end of the day, the idea is that we're dealing with a form of anaerobic fermentation. So not unlike our muscle cells produce um, lactic acid in the absence of, you know, oxygen, when you know you're finishing out that set or finishing off that run or, you know, uh, you know, reaching for, you know, another turkey drumstick, um, uh, grapes will produce um, alcohol in the absence of oxygen under specific conditions. So there are two necessary preconditions uh, for carbonic maceration. And uh, those preconditions are whole clusters, as you see here, and an anaerobic environment. Anaerobic equals 86 oxygen. Uh, now that can be accomplished in a number of different ways. That can be accomplished through the uh, addition of dry ice or CO2 to a fermentation vat that is then sealed off. Or it can be accomplished by the natural action of yeast that will produce CO2 during fermentation. Uh, it should be said that this process, carbonic maceration, is as old as wine itself. It was described as uh, by Louis Pasteur when he was first unraveling mystery fermentation. Um, uh, he spoke approvingly of it in wines, um, you know, as early as the mid to late uh, 19th century. So um, it has been um, a factor in winemaking for as long as there have been wine, but it hasn't been a technique that winemakers have actively employed rigorously until the modern era. So um, wines made in this style are um, thrown into a tank, the whole bunches. So uh, hugely important that the grapes are harvested by hand. And it should be said that in the Beaujolais zone, uh, by law, for a wine to be called Beaujolais, the grapes have to be harvested by hand. Um, if you see Beaujolais on the label at all, you know that's the truth. And that's because carbonic maceration plays such an important part in the making of a lot of these wines. Now, you take these whole clusters, you throw them into a fermentation tank intact. Now, at this point, you can uh, add CO2 yourself and seal off the tank and create an environment in which uh, you know, carbonic maceration uh, occurs in almost all the grapes or you can allow the fruit to naturally settle and a portion of the bunches at the bottom uh, will be crushed and the wine will start to ferment normally. So uh, uh, yeast uh, will start to ferment sugar in that juice and form uh, both alcohol, ethanol, alcohol, and CO2. But as that CO2 um, uh, displaces the air and CO2 uh, itself is um, uh, denser than air, so will displace the air very quickly, um, then uh, in that environment, even without the addition of uh, dry ice or your own gas, 
uh, carbonic maceration will start to happen within these individual grapes. So what is happening within these grapes uh, during the carbonic maceration process? Well, you have a conversion of both sugar and um, malic acid. Uh, remember, there are different types of acid in grapes. Malic acid is the apple acid. It's that green apple acid. Um, it's kind of that harsher acid uh, that we perceive in underripe fruit. Um, you have the conversion of malic acid um, uh, into uh, ethanol, alcohol, um, and other chemical constituents, uh, chiefly glycerol, acetaldehyde, um, and some other uh, uh, chemical constituents that we'll talk about in a minute. So you have malic acid consumed, so those levels go down, sugar consumed, and alcohol levels go up. Um, now, that only proceeds apace for so long. You only get to about 2% alcohol, 2% um, about uh, percent of alcohol in the solution until the grapes um, burst, until the cells die. Um, uh, but during that time, you also have this leaching of anthocyanins. Those are the pigments in the skins of grapes that account for the color in all red wine. Um, uh, those get leached into the flesh of the grapes. Now the flesh of the grape typically clear, uh, but that leaching of uh, that color into um, the flesh um, produces a different kind of grape. So on the right here, um, you see a carbonically macerated grape, whereas on the left, you see a grape that proceeds through a more traditional alcoholic fermentation, um, uh, which is to say that wines that are made in this style tend to have lighter color at the end of the day. Uh, tannins are also leached from the skins into the grape flesh. So um, you also get wines that are lower in tannins than wines of their ilk. Um, so at the end of the day, um, this process, uh, which only accounts for about 2% of the alcohol in a solution until um, uh, the grapes give up the ghost, um, the cell walls rupture. And uh, at that point, the winemaker just presses the grapes like normal and normal uh, uh, fermentation, aerobic fermentation through the action of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, our hero yeast, uh, uh, accomplishes the rest up to 12, 13% alcohol. You know, so it accounts for a relatively narrow bandwidth of alcohol in the solution but it creates all of these really interesting chemical constituents. Um, ethyl cinnamate being one of them, uh, isoamyl acetate being another, um, and uh, a, a chemical signature that's also responsible for an artificial banana flavor. So you get these uh, chemical constituents that give the wine a fresher, freer, bubblegum berry driven quality that we wouldn't typically associate with red wine and also diminish the perception of tannins. Now, this is a flavor wheel, um, uh, uh, three different wines graded um, uh, according to these different dimensions of taste. Um, and uh, this is in Merlot, um, but uh, this is the same set of Merlot um, that has gone through carbonic uh, maceration. Uh, the carbonic rep is uh, the pressed juice from carbonic maceration. So there's a distinction between a free run juice that comes off of that that we saw. And then after they press, um, the juice is uh, a little more dynamic and a little more tannic and a little more intense uh, in terms of um, aromatic, overall aromatic intensity. And then the traditional maceration, uh, the traditional fermentation. Um, so you can see the traditional fermentation has uh, a fuller body and fuller astringency um, than uh, the carbonic uh, maceration wine. And that is the big difference that we notice uh, between these wines uh, at, the, at the end of the day. Um, the carbonic maceration is easier drinking um, and lower in tannins and fresher and fruitier than a more traditional wine. Um, and it has an identity all of its own, um, uh, you know, which is attributable to this technique and, you know, kind of less attributable to um, the grapes such as they existed and came off the vineyard. And, you know, that is variously desirable depending on your perspective. Um, at any rate, um, uh, uh, I want to pause for questions because we've gone through some really wonky um, uh, nerdery for the sake of carbonic maceration. So Zoe, assemble those. It should be said, you know, at the end of the day, why did this um, uh, technique become uh, so popular in Beaujolais? Well, uh, through the work of the gentleman uh, to the left, that is um, Jules Chauvet. Um, he's kind of the godfather of both carbonic maceration, natural wine movement, um, uh, Beaujolais as we know it. Um, he was actually kind of 
um, uh, building on the work of a gentleman named Michel Franzi, who himself is from Languedoc, further in, in uh, south in France. Uh, Jules Sade was, you know, responding to all sorts of problems created by um, aggressive industrial farming methods in his region, um, all sorts of wine faults, um, particularly overabundance of lactic acid in wines, um, which uh, itself stemmed from uh, um, uh, producers kind of picking early, um, underripe grapes that had uh, uh, quite a bit of malic acid, which then was converted into, um, uh, you know, uh, higher amounts of lactic acid. He was wondering, you know, how can we, you know, work with our fruit um, in a more non-interventionist way and produce wines of a uh, place that have, you know, the same uh, um, immediacy um, of, uh, uh, of taste and uh, the same kind of approachable uh, nature. And he arrived at carbonic maceration as um, a, a way to make these aromatically intense wines. And not only was he um, deploying carbonic maceration, but he was doing so at um, uh, lower temperatures. So uh, carbonic maceration tends to proceed faster at higher temperatures and slower at lower temperatures. And at lower temperatures, the you know um, uh, kind of complex aromatics, that aromatic intensity that Jules Chauvet, uh, who's a very gifted taster and worked with a lot of France's premier perfumier, uh, uh, perfume producers um, to improve his uh, tasting chops. Um, uh, you know, so working cold was as much a part of his regime as carbonic maceration was, uh, it should be said. And there is no one carbonic maceration. There are various different ways to uh, work with carbonic maceration in wine. And uh, it should be said too that you know, there is full carbonic maceration for the sake of wine and partial. So you can, you know, uh, work with this technique in all of your wine, all of your grapes, or a, uh, you know, portion of your grapes. And you can do it, um, you know, more aggressively uh, by introducing CO2 yourself, or you can just happen, let it happen haphazardly, which um, tends to give it kind of a less of a full imprint of that kind of carbonic sets of flavors. Now, Jules Save, um, starting in 1981, found this ready acolyte, acolyte in Marcel Lapier. Uh, he and his gang of merry men, um, uh, Guy Breton, um, uh, uh, Jules uh, Fouillard, um, and um, uh, well, uh, Chaminard uh, was, was a, a part of that group um, uh, as well, um, uh, Gang of Four or Gang of Five, depending on um, uh, uh, your uh, Pope Paul Fibne, um, depending on your frame of reference, uh, kind of popularized that methodology and it became um, associated with the region and became associated with natural wine more broadly, uh, which we're going to get to just uh, in a moment uh, for the sake of the Spanish wine that uh, we'll be considering briefly. But uh, I promised a um, uh, question, Zoe, and then I, I continued to bloviate. Um, uh, hit me. Um, yeah, to start off with, um, are there certain grapes um, other than Gamay that respond well to carbonic maceration? Or what is it about Gamay specifically that responds well to carbonic maceration? That is the eternal question when it comes to carbonic maceration. So Jules Chauvet was working with uh, Gamay in a particular context in the very granitic soils of Beaujolais. Um, he uh, later in life actually um, uh, kind of uh, moved away from carbonic maceration and favored um, uh, destemming his fruit and making wines in a more kind of traditional uh, manner um, without the aggressive input of that, you know, kind of uh, particular technique. Um, uh, he advocated it for Gamay. He thought it was good for grapes like Carignan and Grenache and Languedoc. Um, and he saw a place for it, you know, with, you know, some Jura varietals like Dussard. Uh, he thought for other varietals, um, it tended to um, run roughshod over uh, the character of the grapes. Um, it tended to diminish varietal character. It tended to diminish a sense of place um, uh, in a way that he, he didn't like. Um, so I, I'm quoting a different um, kind of titan of French natural wine. This is uh, from Eric Tessier. Uh, he's talking about carbonic maceration. He said, it's an efficient technique with which to make natural wines, um, which is to say, you know, to make wines with a minimum amount of intervention um, in uh, the cellar. Um, but uh, it gives such a strong aromatic um, signature that the result often shows more of the technique itself than the terroir, except in very specific combinations. And uh, the combination, uh, you know, that he was speaking of um, was uh, 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 Beaujolais and Gamay, um, cheaply. Um, you know, but for, for other grapes like uh, Cabernet Sauvignon um, has such a strong varietal imprint that, you know, um, uh, carbonic doesn't make a, a, a lot of sense. Um, you know, it can work with Cap Franc. Um, uh, it can work um, in places or in portions with Syrah and Pinot, but, um, you know, it's this 
um, you know, eternal question of, you know, what is attributable to, you know, the artifice and, and, and what belongs in the art, um, such as it is, and, and how do we balance the two, you know, how do we, you know, balance this question of, you know, what is innately special about this great um, and, you know, does this technique enhance that character um, or um, are we making something that's just ubiquitously carbonic? Um, and, and that is something that you know, I think natural winemakers are thinking about quite a bit right now um, as the technique has become more ubiquitous uh, throughout the natural wine world. And that's really the question for us today as we as we taste through these wines, Zoe. So that was a, a very uh, excellent question. Um, oh, what else you got? I was hoping it would be, I kind of early called that in the chat. So glad you agree. Um, <laughs> are there different climates that are better suited for? Um, you, guys are, you guys are fucking killing it with the questions here. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily uh, think so. You know, it's a technique that has been deployed in Beaujolais, um, uh, which is kind of a less marginal climate than, than Burgundy to the north, but, you know, um, not the, you know, great Valhalla, certainly that Languedoc does. Um, uh, but it's equally deployed, you know, for grapes like Cap Franc in the Loire. Um, really thoughtfully. Um, so uh, I don't think there's one climate that can lay claim to carbonic maceration um, as, a, as a technique. Um, you know, it necessitates fully ripe, um, uh, you know, clean fruit um, because you're working with whole clusters, um, uh, you know, in, in the vat. You know, typically, you know, you wouldn't want, um, you know, under ripe grapes, although, you know, some of the malic acid would be converted. Um, you know, I, I, I would, you know, think that's something you would, you know, kind of um, consciously uh, avoid. Um, but uh, I think it's a winemaking technique that lends itself to a lot of different applications, which is what a lot of uh, natural winemakers really like about it. And, um, you know, it uh, tends to produce um, wines really efficiently um, because, you know, during that uh, carbonic maceration product uh, process, you get, um, uh, you know, this kind of um, uh, breakdown of, um, uh, you know, grapes into different, you know, chemical constituents that be become food for yeast and uh, kind of kickstart this, you know, um, really active ferment um, after that carbonic maceration process um, wraps up. Um, and, and that carbonic maceration process can last anywhere from, you know, um, uh, two to three days to two weeks, depending on how cold you keep your tanks. What else you got? Um, who made Beaujolais Nouveau taboo? Whose fault is it? Um, it's Georgia Buff's fault. Um, but, you know, it, it's both it, to his credit and to his fault um, that, it, that it became um, the fad that it did. So he was a genius for the sake of marketing. He took this, you know, um, off the beaten path underdog wine that is Beaujolais, and he, he made it this global phenomenon for the sake of this, you know, marketing event. Um, you know, uh, in November, um, he gave Americans excuse to drink on a weekday. And we're always looking for that, whether it's St. Patrick's Day or the third Thursday in November. Um, and, you know, people ran with it. It didn't matter to them that the wine was unremarkable and tasted like, you know, um, bubble gum that you get out of a dispensing machine. You know, the mere fact of easy drinking alcohol was necessary. Now, uh, the problem was that uh, he encouraged the uh, wine growers, uh, the grape growers of Beaujolais to massively overproduce Gamay uh, to the point that, you know, um, he, uh, um, you know, kind of um, oversold his product and the market uh, became oversaturated with really shitty wine. Um, so much so that it had to be thrown back into the still and, you know, purchased back by the French government. Um, you know, so, uh, it, it went from this great success story, um, to this kind of, you know, regional embarrassment. Um, and then furthermore, um, Beaujolais Nouveau, um, this unique kind of seasonal phenomenon became conflated with Beaujolais the region and, uh, Beaujolais the region makes these, you know, uh, much more, you know, kind of profound wants, um, uh, throughout the crew zone. And some of those are made with, with carbonic maceration, but some aren't. And, you know, some of those wines are as great as the greatest wines of Burgundy, um, to the North. Um, uh, but the, the fact of the success of Dubuff, um, and his allies, um, meant that, um, you know, people came to associate Beaujolais with its, you know, mass marketed, 
um, success story, uh, much the way that people came to associate, you know, Italian or uh, Australian Chardonnay with yellowtail. So, you know, I think, you know, for the sake of these ubiquitous international brands, you know, very often you become a victim of your own success. And that's what happened with Beaujolais. Uh, Groovy, so uh, I'm going to turn our attention now to um, the Spanish wine. And I'm really excited about this one. This one comes from um, uh, southern Spain. Um, so um, I think uh, this is kind of a fascinating case study in the internationalization of this technique, carbonic maceration. So uh, historically, the wine world was very insular. Um, you know, especially in France, especially in like Burgundy proper, um, from one um, cellar to the next, um, you know, winemakers were very tight lipped um, and um, they were not collegial. They were not forthcoming about what was happening in their cellar. Um, they weren't sharing best practices one with the other. Um, you know, it was, it was futile. Um, and, uh, um, you know, that has, you know, fortunately changed. Um, and the wine world is international, uh, much more so than it used to be. People travel uh, from one region to the next. They share knowledge. And uh, there's this lingua franca in wine. And I think that's particularly the case among natural winemakers um, because, you know, they are motivated by a lot of the same concerns for the sake of transparency uh, in terms of how they uh, manipulate and produce their wine in the cellar. And, um, you know, I think, um, you know, for better or worse, um, they are nominated, they are motivated by, um, you know, um, the common good for the sake of producing wine in a way that um, ensures the continued, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, survival of, um, you know, great growing and wine producing in, um, you know, these historic corners of the world. And uh, that doesn't contribute to the degradation of uh, the vineyard or the environment. Um, it doesn't contribute to human misery on a broader scale. Um, and that's to be celebrated. And, um, you know, uh, in as much as uh, biodynamics has become a global phenomenon, carbonic maceration um, has become a global phenomenon. You know, a lot of other things like orange wine, pet mats, um, these are all part of the vocabulary. And, you know, a lot of them started out as fads, but, you know, they have come to transcend that. And uh, there are, you know, effective, um, you know, wines made uh, in this style and ineffective, uh, ineffective ones. Um, uh, we're moving now to uh, Tempranillo. Um, and Tempranillo is the most widely grown red grape in Spain. Uh, I think a lot of people have a, a preconceived notion of Tempranillo as a big, brutish wine. Um, even in Rioja, it makes these full-fruited, oaky wines. Um, you know, Rioja can be hugely elegant, particularly in the Rioja Alta zone and Rioja Alavesa zone. Um, uh, but, you know, typically it sees quite a bit of oak. Now, historically, that wasn't always the case. There was actually, um, prior to the arrival of the merchants from Bordeaux, um, after uh, the pernicious yellow aphid phylloxera hit um, uh, you know, the Gironde estuary, a lot of them disencamped to Rioja. Uh, but before they did and started kind of, you know, uh, making wines in their own image, there was a long tradition of making wine with carbonic maceration in Rioja uh, from Tempranillo. Um, this kind of um, is a wine that kind of reverts back to that tradition. Um, it comes from Southern Spain. So we're gonna zoom in here. Um, uh, Spain's tallest mountains, um, are actually the Sierra Nevadas, Sierra, uh, Sierra Nevadas um, uh, and uh, they uh, kind of run east-west along the southern Mediterranean here, um, above uh, uh, Malaga um, and Granada. Uh, and um, uh, this comes from a good-looking Spanish uh, gentleman um, who is a proud champion of uh, wines from this region. His name is Ramon uh, uh, Saavedra. Um, and this is his kind of homage to um, Tempranillo as it was, you know, produced in Rioja in the 19th century is fully carbonic Tempranillo. Um, now he is in a very hot climate. Um, uh, he works against that in a few different ways. Uh, he's making wine at elevation somewhere between, um, you know, 300, 600 meters. Um, he's working with north facing slopes, typically in more marginal climates. You always want to be south facing because you get more sun in the northern hemisphere. But in hotter region, it pays to be north facing because, you know, you get a little less of that uh, aggressive, um, uh, you know, kind of ripening solar power. Um, uh, and then uh, he's working with, um, you know, carbonic maceration, which also produces this fresher, easier drinking wine. Uh, I particularly adore this one because it has uh, a really kick-ass label. Um, anytime you can throw a centaur on your label, you know, I think you should. That's just a good rule of thumb. And the centaur is like a happy centaur. 
you know, we're not guarding the labyrinth, um, you know, against, you know, the Dallas um, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, you know, the Dallas built the labyrinth. I forget who, who's, who's running around the labyrinth. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, the, the Minotaur was haunting the labyrinth, but, you know, we're not, we're not, you know, eating and, and consuming any all comers. We're, we're, you know, we're, you're know, watering the vines. We're, you know, we're working the land here. I dig that. Um, uh, furthermore, this is wine called Cabronicas. Um, so that's a play on carbonic, obviously, but cabron, great Spanish word, basically means bastard, but like in kind of like a, a fun, um, you know, uh, uh, collegial uh, uh, sense. Um, but I adore uh, this wine. Uh, for me, this is like a perfect natural wine. Uh, you know, it is, um, you know, fun, festive, fruity, easy drinking, uh, but um, it is not flawed. Um, there's no uh, rodent climbing out of the bottle for the sake of mousiness. Um, you know, there's no volatile acid. Doesn't taste like fucking vinegar. You know, it's just you know immediately refreshing uh, and and joyful. Uh, any thoughts on uh, the bastard here? And uh, how does it compare uh, to people's uh, preconceived notion of Tempranillo? And how does it compare to the Gamay that we tasted uh, previously? So, what do you got? Well, a lot soft. Um, a lot easier to get to know. Um, a, a more of a gentle minotaur or a collegial minotaur. Um, yeah, we're in touch with our feelings. The minotaur is very, very in touch with his feelings. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, absolutely to see it with its um, purity, if you will, with all that like black pepper spice, um, but not in the hitting over your head or without the the use of oak, I think is is interesting. Um, barnyardy on the nose, but it's crazy tasty. And earlier, um, there was a lot of discussion about how um, the nose from wine can be so different from the actual flavors, just yeah. like how sulfur will play. Um, perhaps you can expand upon that for a minute. I mean, I, I love wines that have that um, sleight of hand, um, that, you know, have that disjuncture uh, between, you know, perception, um, you know, of, you know, that aromatic realm and uh, perception on the palate. Um, and, you know, this is certainly one of those. Um, this wine does have like a, a chewiness to it um, that I adore. I, I think it's, it's certainly more tannic uh, than uh, a previous one um, uh, we tasted. That has everything to do with Tempranillo grown in a warmer environment. You know, um, you can... Um, you know, diminish tannins, but you can't eradicate them entirely from a grape like Tempranillo that is inherently more tannic than, than Gamay. Um, I definitely get that farmyardy dimension. Um, um, it should be said for the sake of uh, carbonic maceration that that process of reducing the malic acid in wine and raising the pH can invite um, microbiological bad actors. That's why Jules Chauvet favored cooler uh, uh, temperatures in his ferments because uh, that warded off um, those spoilage agents. Um, uh, you know, but um, very often with um, uh, wines that are made in this carbonic macerated style, sometimes you'll get uh, Britannomyces in the mix, which is a wild yeast that gives you that horse blanket funk. Um, I don't think the Cabernicus has a ton of that. Um, I've had this wine in previous vintages and it, and it has. Um, for me, this was like pleasantly barnyardy. It's not like in your face, horse blanket, um, you know, um, and, and, you know, sometimes that can be the case um, uh, with these wines. You know, um, I, I do like the image of this, you know, kinder, gentler minotaur. Um, you know, I, I think that's like a perfect metaphor for the sake of this kinder, gentler Spanish red wine. You know, I, I think, you know, it's one of those, you know, things that you can typecast, you know, and, and we're talking Spanish wine outside of Galicia. Galicia is kind of like a different country, but, you know, the Spanish wine of popular imagination is, you know, from a, a dusty air plane, you know, it's like Don Quixote, you know, chasing, chasing windmills, old bush vines, you know, densely tannic and, you know, beefy. Um, and, and this is kinder gentler, you know, uh, you know, it's almost like you can, you know, squint and see, the outline of that wine, but you know, it's like we've made this conscious effort to to rein it in and play nice. Um, you know, it's like Tony Soprano at a tea party, um, and and I think that's that's kind of cool um, uh, for the for the sake of this one. Um, and you know, I think it still you know has um, you know some um, of the um, qualities that we expect of Tempranillo. I don't think we've totally run roughshod over varietal character, but. Um, it definitely bears that carbonic uh, imprint. Um, onward and upward now, um, and moving to the central coast of California. So uh, this is from Saltman, um, uh, back to um, stomping grounds of, um, you know, our 
um, uh, a kind of uh, opening poet, uh, Robinson Jeffers. And um, uh, this one comes from uh, a smaller subzone of the Central Coast. So uh, it should be said more broadly that uh, uh, in California, um, as far as growing, growing conditions go, um, proximity to the coast, um, uh, unimpeded access to the cooling influence of the Pacific is more important than latitude. Um, uh, so um, we are gonna be in a region now uh, that um, is cooler than the Napa Valley, um, many uh, degrees of latitude to the north. So you can see the Napa is off the map to the north. Uh, I hope no one's yakking. Uh, we are going to be in Ballard Canyon. So you see um, uh, Ballard Canyon is this arrow that points to kind of the center of the donut here in Santa Barbara. So um, you're uh, uh, along the coast. Santa Barbara is beautiful. Santa Barbara is, is sideways country. Um, uh, we're not drinking Merlot, uh, yada, yada. Um, uh, Ballard Valley, north, south oriented. Um, it is open to the Pacific uh, for the sake of a cooling influence. So you get this fog um, that is literally pulled into um, uh, the valley here, the canyon, uh, but only makes it so far. Um, and uh, this particular um, estate, Stoltman, is at the northern end of the valley, so there's a little less of that uh, influence of the fog there because they're fully, full, more fully removed from the Pacific. Um, it uh, kind of originally developed as a side project of a lawyer. So this is Tom Stoltman. He's just a cool looking dude. So I thought I'd share his picture. Um, uh, his son actually kind of made Stoltman what it is. Um, uh, Tom grew grapes. He had this weakness for Rhone grapes. Syrah in particular does really well in Ballard Canyon, but also Sangiovese. He's this huge champion of Sangiovese. Uh, Sangiovese um, is Italy's most widely grown red grape, goes into um, uh, Chianti, goes into Brunello, goes into Vino Nobile, the Monte Pulciano. Um, uh, it is both a high acid and, and, and kind of a, a tannic red. Um, uh, and, you know, we love it for that. Um, uh, and uh, Tom loves it for that and uh, became one of its foremost champions in California. Um, uh, we're drinking Love You Bunches, um, uh, which is made in a carbonic style. Um, I adore this wine. Um, I, I should have brought I should have purchased more of it. I didn't realize it was as limited as it is. Uh, this is fully carbonic. Obviously, we're having fun with the fact that um, uh, we're dealing with whole bunch fermentation. Um, this wine, to me, speaks to the fact that, again, you know, we're taking this technique that has become synonymous with, um, you know, uh, Beaujolais and, uh, by extension, this pioneering, you know, kind of forefathers of the natural wine movie making movement. And we're taking it to, you know, this different corner of the world. And, um, you know, we are applying it to a grape that we don't typically associate with California and making something that's just like really delightful. Um, now, uh, San Giovese, um, you know, uh, is a very perfumey grape in, in certain iterations. Um, it can express a lot of cherry fruit. Um, it can express, you know, this kind of tomato plant herbaceousness. Um, for me, um, uh, this, this one is, is uh, you know, uh, bringing some of that stewed tomato to the party, um, uh, but in a fresher, fruitier style um, than, you know, I would typically expect certainly of, of Chianti, which, you know, um, uh, is, is a wine, you know, uh, Sangiovese in, you know, it's, it's Tuscan context, a wine that leans more uh, heavily into tannins. Uh, so you're taking, um, you know, uh, feverish notes, uh, almost like you're at like a presidential debate. Um, uh, what do you have uh, for the sake of your note taking? Is he the only one making Sangiovese there? Uh, he is certainly not. I know the folks at Tandem make Sangiovese. Um, uh, um, you know, there are some other uh, folks uh, that work with um, the grape uh, in, in California. Syrah is really kind of the grape of choice in Ballard Canyon. Um, our friend Peter Passon makes Syrah there. Um, at Pied Sassy. Um, so... Um, it's more Rhone varietals that have flourished there than Central Italian ones, but uh, Tom in particular uh, and his son um, uh, and uh, daughter-in-law had become uh, champions of Sangiovese. Um, I really adore the wine that we brought in from him too, um, which is Trousseau. Um, Trousseau, um, uh, as those of you who tuned in for our Jura class will remember, um, is, is a, a grape that uh, thrives in Eastern France, but it equally thrives as Bastardia. Um, uh, in Portugal, um, in port of all things. Um, uh, so it's this great mystery um, uh, for the sake of, you know, um, especially in the middle ages, how these, you know, cultivars 
land um, from one corner of the continent to the next. But um, uh, that's a wine, um, uh, if you want to try it on, it's made of partial carbonic. So again, we spoke earlier about, um, you know, semi-carbonic versus full carbonic. And it should be said that full carbonic is this like asymptotic uh, limit. You know, you can never really get full carbonic um, because at some point, you know, some of the grapes are crushed. There's some juice, um, unless you like sealed grapes in like a plastic bag with CO2, that would be full carbonic, but, but that would be a really weird way to make wine. Um, there are some people like in Australia that do that because Aussies are crazy and they're willing to try anything for the sake of the science of wine. Um, but you know, I uh, never quite get to full carbonic. Um, uh, semi-carbonic is, is a decision that, you know, um, you know, maybe we'll just let this happen naturally uh, for a portion of our fruit and we won't crush it. Or very often producers will do this thing. Uh, it's called like the lasagna method of winemaking where they throw whole clusters between um, uh, layers of crushed grapes um, in a fermentation vessel. Um, and they'll get some um, of that, you know, uh, carbonic influence, um, but, um, it's, it's much more uh, muted. Um, and that also tends to uh, create a fermentation that is a, a little slower, that happens at a lower temperature. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to work with this technique. And um, I think it has this identifiable imprint for the sake of flavor. And I think it's something that, you know, if you are hip to, you can start to recognize in wine um, in, in a really uh, fun and fluid way, which is kind of a good segue uh, to our white wine here. Um, I just think this is fucking delicious. Um, like I said, um, uh, I, I wish I had committed to more of it. Um, I didn't realize it was uh, as limited as it is. But, you know, at the end of the day, wine and agricultural product and, you know, um, you know, we equally celebrate the ephemerality. Uh, of it all um, for the sake of, um, you know, it's kind of like the ultimate, like, uh, um, uh, memento mori. So this like long Renaissance creation of like, it's like Hamlet has skull on his desk. So, you know, being reminded of our own uh, ephemerality is not always a bad thing. Um, at any rate, um, uh, that was a deep dive into our own mortality for the sake of uh, San Giovese from the Ballard Canyon. Any comments on that one, Zoe? Uh, no, I think I think it's perfect. Um, can you talk a little bit about the acidity? There's a lot of comments about um, its texture, and and, and I think like um, saying drying out or yeah. it's really like tingling. I think someone said springy. Is that yeah? So you have a few things happening there, so um, which I find fascinating. So on one hand, um, carbonic maceration tends to dampen your perception of a city in wine, which is to say, um, the acid levels themselves are lower empirically. Um, so um, uh, measurable um, uh, acid, uh, particularly malic acid, uh, as a uh, constituent in, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of like uh, the um, uh, kind of winemakers will measure acid in grams per liter, uh, titratable acidity, uh, the same way they measure uh, residual sugar in grams per liter. Um, and that goes down, um, uh, which means pH um, uh, rises. Um, uh, so empirically, uh, that lowers. But tannins also diminish. So um, uh, uh, that kind of works against the perception of acidity. So the higher the, higher the tannins, you know, they, they kind of affect the way we perceive acidity in wine. Um, uh, so the fact that the tannins aren't there, you know, makes us perceive something as kind of like fresher and brighter uh, than we would otherwise. Um, you also have glycerol produced. Glycerol is alcohol sugar. Um, it doesn't always register as sweet for us, but um, it registers as weight on the palate. Um, acetaldehyde also will register as weight on the palate. Uh, acetaldehyde famously produced in sherry, among other things. So, um, and then you get a lot of dissolved CO2 in these wines as a conscious wine making decision um, uh, when they're bottled. That gives them this kind of like pin prickle uh, acidity. Um, so you have all these dimensions, but I, I find, you know, with a lot of these carbonic macerated wines that, you know, that glycerol in particular registers as weight um, on the palate, um, uh, you know, uh, and the, you know, the acid is, is fresh, um, but there is something, you know, kind of uh, a, a little uh, springy um, about the wines for lack, for lack of a better word. And, um, you know, uh, they are fresh, but they're not austere. And, you know, it's not this like citric fruit that you're embracing, you know, um, it's this, you know, kind of crunchier quality of fruit um, that you get um, uh, from these wines. And there is something that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, texturally a little chewy um, about them uh, on, on top of that. Um, and that brings us, that's a great segue, honestly, for the sake of this white. So um, carbonic maceration almost without fail um, is a technique that is 
um, uh, you know, deployed for the sake of red wines. But in this instance, we have a renegade winemaker. The very name of this winery, Kolpok, is an idiomatic German expression for basically like a um, iconoclast, uh, one who marches to the beat of his own drummer, um, which as someone that, you know, um, uh, pours fine wine at a Michelin star restaurant in a transparent white t-shirt appeals to me. Um, so uh, Cold Folk um, is in uh, Bergenland um, in Eastern Austria. And uh, he took over the family domain um, uh, and I'll pull up a picture of a uh, winemaker um, in, in just a moment, uh, Stefan uh, Balanchitz. Um, and uh, he wanted to make an orange wine, but one that didn't have an aggressive tannic imprint. Um, and uh, as such, he worked with Grunewaldiner, his most widely grown grape in Austria, and Welsh Riesling, uh, which is a very widely grown grape throughout um, uh, Central Europe. Uh, ironically, Welsh Riesling, not related to Riesling itself. Um, uh, Stefan is the gentleman with the long hair and the beard in the middle here um, that, you know, um, he, he's a bit of the, you know, goose for the sake of our duck, duck, goose game. Um, uh, it definitely looks like the cold folk um, uh, in the mix. Um, but uh, what I love about his wines is that they are, um, you know, uniformly, um, you know, wines uh, that are made in a non-interventionist style. And, you know, he embraces carbonic maceration. He embraces a lot of these, you know, kind of trends in natural winemaking, but he does so in a, a, a very expert, um, sophisticated uh, way where uh, the art uh, is not superseded by the artifice and uh, there's not a rodent crawling out of the bottle and the wines are matter of factly delicious. Um, uh, and again, you know, it's all serving an end. You know, at the end of the day, whatever you're drinking, I feel like, you know, whether it's a wine made in a more conventional way or one made with carbonic maceration, you know, the wine should stand on its, two, two, its own two legs and you should have a sense of its own, um, you know, uh, deliciousness or, or just its own completeness, um, uh, you know, without, um, you know, stripping it back um, and, you know, uh, you know, justifying it for the sake of its means of production, uh, which is to say that, you know, you shouldn't have to say, I like this wine because it's made in a carbonic style. Um, or more importantly, I shouldn't like this wine because it's made without sulfur or, you know, uh, because it's quote unquote natural, um, you know, dogmatically, you know, the wine should um, stand on its own two legs. It should cohere in and of itself. And I feel like uh, everything that Stefan does um, uh, succeeds admirably uh, to that end. And this particular wine uh, sees a very long uh, period, um, uh, a very long uh, cold carbonic maceration, talking nine weeks. Um, uh, for the sake of 70% Grunewald Liener and 30% and of uh, Riesling. Um, and he does that because he wants to extract some of the more interesting, you know, qualities that the skins provide in wine. Um, some of those uh, more dynamic sets of flavors um, and textures, but without giving an orange wine that aggressively tannic dimension. Um, and uh, I think this is hugely fascinating, especially having tasted some of the carbonic reds, because um, I think, you know, some of the flavors that are readily identifiable in the red wines are readily identifiable in this orange wine uh, in a way that, uh, you know, for me uh, is, is vindicating for the ways in which, you know, methodology can inform uh, what we, we taste in the glass, but really um, is confounding uh, for the ways in which we tend to um, distinguish white from red and put them on separate planets. Um, and I think that's super cool. Um, uh, for the sake of, of this particular offering. Uh, any thoughts on this one, Zoe? Yes. Um, this one is also um, like, pairs well with pop rocks and jelly beans. Um, I think that also is a comment on its acidity and that, that texture and that chewiness. Um, I do want to go back to something that you said where you related Beaujolais to beer um, and exactly what you meant by that if, if, if in terms of like consistency or with um, maybe it was perhaps when you were talking about um, flaws in wine and that like Bretagne manises is like totally normal to have in some beers when it that Brett becomes too much in wine it becomes a flaw. I just I kind of missed exactly what that. Yeah was. I mean there were there were a lot there were a lot of um, 
you know, kind of uh, parallels to tease out there, though. Um, uh, in that context, in the beer of wines, I was speaking in Miller High Life terms, just for the sake of uh, something that is uh, easy drinking, um, uh, you know, something that is thirst quenching and uh, matter of factly delicious, and you don't have to linger over uh, too long to enjoy. You know, it should be said at the end of harvest, almost all winemakers that I know, um, you know, throw back uh, beer. Uh, because wine starts to feel like work. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of these glue blue wines are, uh, they serve that place, you know, uh, they're fresh, they're easy drinking. Um, and, uh, you know, the best of them aren't, you know, uh, one dimensional. Uh, the best of them are, you know, um, multifaceted, but um, they are still, um, you know, wildly refreshing in a way that, you know, allows you to turn off a little bit. Um, and, and I think that's important. Um, I think the cold focus is, is something else entirely. Um, I think texturally, um, it's definitely of, um, uh, you know, the same species um, as, as the wines we enjoyed. I, I think, you know, texturally, um, you know, going from this, uh, going from the Sangiovese to um, uh, the Colfo, you know, they very um, uh, much, you know, kind of vibrate on the same wavelength. And, and I think that's, that's really interesting to me and really exciting to me. Um, uh, and, um, you know, I think that's one of the things that orange wine does uh, really beautifully. You know, it brings... Um, into the mix, a lot of flavors that we more typically associate um, uh, with white wines, um, but uh, texturally, um, it plays with food in a way that red wine does, and that allows it to, um, you know, go up against, you know, some fatty or richer dishes uh, than, um, you know, a, you know, more conventionally um, uh, styled uh, white wine uh, would be would be able to. Fascinating. Um, uh, all this talk about beer and Miller High Life, and then all I want to think about is COTRO and it's spiked into Miller High Life. I hear you. Um, <laughs> um, could you talk a little bit more about the um, the wildfires in Spain and how that affected the wine industry there? Uh, I, I wish I could speak to that more um, uh, kind of expertly, uh, Zoe. Um, wildfires are, um, uh, you know, sadly because of global warming, um, a, um, a more um, regular uh, feature uh, from vintage to vintage um, across the world, particularly in drier corners of the world. And uh, Spain, with the exception of green Spain, uh, is universally a drier corner of the wine world. Um, it's hard to talk about fires anywhere um, uh, unless you are on the ground. Um, you know, wildfires in particular are, you know, uh, maddeningly um, fickle um, for the sake of burning, you know, one plot and not another. Um, obviously, smoke taint um, is uh, a more uh, widely uh, kind of uh, dispersed, um, you know, issue um, uh, for the sake of those wildfires. But even that, um, you know, depending on, you know, prevailing winds uh, is is hugely inconsistent. Um, and uh, so I, I can't knowledge, knowledge really speak uh, from, from one producer to uh, next about how um, wines were affected. You know, I found in my, my own conversations with producers that I've continually been surprised for better and worse at how um, particular regions or particularly wineries in regions that, you know, I thought were decimated by fires were, were affected. Um, you know, it should be said that, you know, carbonic maceration is not a magic bullet um, uh, when it comes to smoke taint. Um, you know, you need intact whole clusters that are, you know, pretty pristine um, to work carbonically. Um, you know, the only out um, for the sake of smoke taint and, and red grapes um, is rosé. Um, you know, uh, so, you know, at some point you need, um, you know, uh, influence of, you know, the flavors you get out of the skins. And if you're worried about smoke taint in the wine, um, then, you know, even carbonic maceration um, will not, um, you know, allow you uh, to, to, you know, make something that is more extracted than, than you would be able to otherwise. Hey, Bill, where's the ring light? Uh, the, yeah, the, the, um, I think this is like a subtle cue from the staff. Uh, not so subtle. <laughs> yeah, that uh, I need to. I, I really need to get one of those fancy like uh, ring lights uh, for the sake of. Uh, uh, this is like the uh, the twilight sexy lighting um, portion of our. Um, although I was I was actually very excited, and, and it should be said that 
our service director, Shauna Driscoll, is very excited that um, we got some press recently uh, that favorably compared our lighting scheme at the restaurant to a movie theater. Um, so this is this is my movie theater lighting. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, um, do we expect just there to be? Well, I guess this question kind of answers itself, but global warming is probably not slowing down anytime soon, but the accumulation of soil, of ash in the soil, is that something that compounds very noticeably from year to year, or does it take, or is it a little bit more gradual? Um, um, to um, uh, it, it's kind of your cross purposes there. So ash in the soil, or ash in the, uh, ash on grape skins, bad. Ash in soil can be very good um, for the sake of fertility. Um, uh, especially in kind of smaller layers. So, um, yeah, so, uh, uh, that's, you know, I never want to invite wildfires, but actually like wildfires in the context of, you know, um, uh, like old growth forests, you know, can be, um, you know, the, the process of, um, you know, kind of, um, burning down can be a, a part of renewal in as much as it can be, you know, actively devastating. So um, very different um, accumulating in the soil than it is uh, on, on grape skins. Um, but global warming is not going anywhere. We're all fucked. Um, you know, uh, we're all, you know, especially in the context of winemaking, um, just coming to terms with. Um, and, you know, I, I think that um, I, I like the place that winemakers, a lot of winemakers come from. It's one's a it's less one of like, um, you know, kind of chicken littling, you know, it's less one of, you know, uh, we're all fucked, you know, let's, you know, wear our tinfoil hats and retreat to our bomb shelters. And it's one of, you know, we've been making wine, you know, in our corner of the world for generations upon generations. We will continue to make wine because it is, you know, part of our um, culture. Um, we consider it part of a life well lived. Um, you know, our challenge is to continue to do so in a way that will allow our children um, to, you know, perpetuate this tradition um, and uh, continue to do so, um, given, you know, these new dynamics on the ground. And, you know, we are very, very much in the Anthropocene epic and, you know, um, a, uh, a rise in temperature of, uh, you know, we're looking at now two to three degrees uh, centigrade by the end of this century. Um, is is unforeseen and unprecedented um, in geologic history, um, not just in, in human history. And, you know, no one knows how that's going to affect a lot of natural processes, uh, least of all grape growing. But um, I think the cool thing about um, viticulture is that it is kind of like the perfection of agriculture, as I see it. It's the highest form of agriculture. And, um, you know, it is one of the most studied forms of agriculture, at least insofar as you know, the taste of the end product is concerned. Um, and, you know, so we have more tools at our disposal there uh, than we do uh, for the sake of other forms of viticulture. And so, you know, it's a place where I believe in, in human ingenuity. And, you know, we won't be making the same kind of wine um, at the end of this century uh, that we were making at the beginning of this century. And that will be deeply sad in a lot of places, but we still will be making great wine. And there's more great wine available now than there ever has been. And, you know, that is, is worth celebrating. Um, all right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna close things out. Uh, so bring it back to, to glue glue. Um, you know, I, I think it's interesting for the sake of this, this discourse, we, you know, tried a bunch of different wines. We tried reds, we tried whites, you know, and, you know, we thought about, you know, to what extent um, is this flavor profile um, uh, attributable to this technique in carbonic maceration versus, you know, this hodgepodge of grapes and regions. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, it's like the Forrest Gump, uh, it's a bit of both kind of thing. Um, and, you know, I, I think I think there's truth to that. You know, I think at the end of the day, it, it should be a bit of both. But, you know, wine is equally many things. And so what if, you know, a wine tastes more carbonic than it tastes like California Sangiovese or, you know, um, you know, Spanish uh, Tempranillo or even, you know, Gamay from Beaujolais. At the end of the day, if it's delicious and it's affordable, then that's worth celebrating too. Um, a lot of the producers that we've dealt with, particularly Stoltman um, and, you know, certainly uh, Corniak and, and um, uh, Marcel Lapier's nephew um, at um, uh, this domain, you know, they make a lot of different wines, you know, so they'll make, you know, the beer of wines, but they'll equally make more age-worthy wines. 
um, uh, as well. And, and wine doesn't have to be one thing to be enjoyable, you know, and, and glue glue doesn't have to be one thing either. It doesn't have to be an excuse to drink a whole bottle yourself. Uh, it can be, you know, um, uh, you know, an excuse to um, appreciate um, wine as a part of the fabric of life, as part of, you know, a healthier life for the sake of something that you know, you can drink a bottle of and not feel like um, uh, shit, you know, uh, the next day. So uh, this is from Lee Campbell. She's a kick-ass song in Brooklyn, but I like what she says about, um, you know, this notion of buggable wine. Uh, the soul of glue isn't um, raging and gluttony and overconsumption. It's access of quality, health, and moderation. So uh, cheers to that. Cheers to you all at home uh, enjoying these uh, festive, uh, gluggable wines on this holiday weekend. Happy motherfucking Hanukkah uh, to uh, all you Maccabees in the crowd uh, celebrating, uh, you know, keep that dreidel spinning, uh, keep, uh, you know, those chocolate coins flowing. Uh, all my love. Salud. So you're the best. Cheers.